Greetings, beloved, and welcome to the Linda Jernigan Show. I'm your host, Linda Jernigan, and it is my hope that you will be inspired to aspire for God's purpose for your life through this program. My name is Raleigh Mayberry Jr., and I am an ex-homosexual. I am a husband. Uh, I have a wonderful wife. We've been married for seven and a half years now. I'm a father. I have three lovely children, two uh, sons and a daughter. Uh, I'm an assistant pastor, church called All Nations Worship Assembly in Chicago, Illinois. I'm a, a son, a hard worker, a loving, compassionate, caring person. That's who I am. I was a homosexual. I can always remember in my childhood, I never felt comfortable in my own skin. I always knew that there was something different about me. And I didn't quite know how to identify what it was, but I could always remember feeling like I was set apart from the other children in my, in my school. Um, I remember uh, the, the kids used to call me names because I was different. I didn't like playing sports like the other boys. I didn't do the flips and the tumbles and the sit-ups and push-ups in gym class. I didn't know how to fight. I didn't rough house. I didn't hang out with the boys. And so I was always very different. I didn't have girlfriends. And that became very difficult for me because being different like that in school, children make you the center of ridicule. And so I learned what rejection was in an early age. I always wondered, um, always wondered what it would feel like to just be accepted and be normal like the other boys. I always wonder what it would feel like to know how to play basketball, know how to play football, what it would feel like to uh, wrestle and, and roughhouse with the other boys. I always wondered what it was like, but something in me could just never identify with that. At that time, we're, we're talking about third and fourth grade. Um, so at that time, I was probably about uh, seven, eight years old. And I can remember when the kids started to call me gay or they started to identify me as a fag. I didn't know what that meant at the time. And so I remember asking my mom about it and she explained, I don't quite remember her explanation, but whatever it was, I, I didn't really connect with it. And so as I went along in school, it just became very difficult to hear these names. And obviously, as I got older, we're talking sixth, seventh grade, I started to understand what it meant to be gay. My dad was not around. Um, um, the issue with my father, he was a drug addict and alcoholic. And so he was always in and out of my life. He was very abusive to my mother. So when my father was around and when he did come home, he was always high on some type of drug. He was always drunk. And I could just remember him and my mom fighting. And I was a little boy, and so I would just stand there and scream, please stop, please stop. And they wouldn't stop. And so my father's existence in my life was I would see him once, and then maybe it would be five or six years before I would see him again. And that became very difficult for me because I learned the reason why some of the other boys in my school and around me knew how to play sports and knew how to fight and knew what a lot of things were that were, were normal activities for boys. I learned that they learned these things from their father or their uncle or an older cousin or some older male figure in their lives that taught them this. I didn't have that especially because without my father, my mom didn't have a very good relationship with our family. And so I was not allowed around older cousins or uncles. My mother sheltered me and kept me to herself. She would do what any mother would try to do, comfort her child. She would try to comfort me and tell me, don't worry about what other kids say. Don't worry about what they're saying about you. Ignore them. Just stay focused in school, do your work. Don't worry about them talking about you. Kids are gonna say mean things. You just have to smile and keep moving. And that's what I did. There's no doubt in my mind that my mother loved me. There's no doubt in my mind that my father loved me. He just wasn't around. But my mother was very supportive. She always cared for me. In being, being someone who had gotten used to or grown accustomed to rejection, as I got older, uh, between the ages of nine and 10 years old, I started really desiring to be accepted. So whatever I needed to do, 
I wanted to be accepted. And so I started to understand just by the nature of getting older and asking questions, what does it mean to be gay? Why are people calling me a fag? Why don't I like sports? No one ever gave me an explanation of saying that you should accept not playing sports. I was always told as a boy, you got to like some sport. So if it's not football, it's basketball. If it's not basketball, it should be baseball. And so I was never, I was never told or affirmed that it is okay for you to not like these things. And so I understood that there was something wrong with me. So by the, by the time I reached the ages of, I would say between nine and 10 years old, uh, my sister and I had gone to live with my maternal aunt because my mom suffered from schizophrenia. And she had a terrible nervous breakdown, which led to us being taken away and placed in the care of my aunt and her fiance at the time. And uh, her fiance had three children and they would come visit on the weekends and we had developed a very good relationship. And so I was excited that finally, I had developed a relationship with children my age that loved me, that accepted me, that didn't call me names, and that made me feel comfortable about myself. And so the oldest one of the group, and this is, this is getting into um, my first sexual encounter and how my sexual character was shaped and my understanding of sexuality was shaped. The oldest one of the group one afternoon uh, we had some quiet time together, uh, nobody else was around, and we were in a room and he asked if I wanted to try something. And I said, okay, sure. And so he told me to put my hand around his waist. And I said, okay, I wasn't real sure about what was going to happen or what was going on. And so I did it. And he said, okay, kiss me. Now when he said that, I hesitated because I had come to learn that that type of interaction between two boys was wrong. But I, out of fear of being rejected again, I just did it. And so I kissed him and we began foreplay. And that began to define our relationship. And so now every time we would get together on weekends, whenever we would have a quiet moment, that is how we would engage with one another. And I remember enjoying it. I, I liked it. But one side of me knew that this type of interaction was wrong, but there was that other side of me that enjoyed it. So after that, um, I had gone on, I had another sexual experience as I got older. I would say my next experience with another male was with an older male cousin. And by this time, I was about 13 years old. And he was the first one that uh, actually introduced me to sex, to penetration. I'd never been introduced to that aspect of sexuality before, but again, I wanted to be accepted. I was happy that another male accepted me and, and cared for me and wanted to be around me just the way that I was. And so I did what he told me to do. He was very dominant, very strong, very masculine. And because I believe I was missing that male figure in my life, I accepted that. And so I wanted to do whatever it is he told me to do just so that he could continue to have that dominant presence in my life. And so we had these interactions quite often. So I got into high school uh, after this, this experience with this male cousin. I got into high school and I was always involved in church. And so as I got older in church, I would see other effeminate guys walking around the church and I would hear how the older ministers and the people were uh, condemning them and talking about them. No one offered them help. I could notice that they were having all types of other problems and issues, but everyone focused on the fact that they were effeminate. So I knew that this was wrong. I knew that the lifestyle that I was living was wrong, but I could not shake the desire because it felt so natural. And so in high school, I came into contact with uh, a man who's now my pastor, and he began to take interest just in me overall. Uh, I was always a loner. I could sit in a room for two hours and there's a party going on and you would never know I was there. And so he, he became my friend and he would talk to me about some of my insecurities and why I felt the way that I felt about things and why I felt the way that I felt about life. And so I started to come into the understanding that the way that I was living was really a manifestation of the rejection that I had suffered as a child. And, and he helped me to understand that just through conversation and taking interest in me. You know, I never really, as a child, I never really remember asking the question or inquiring about God. I knew that I was in church. My mother was, was involved in church a lot. 
I didn't really have much involvement in church until I started to get a little older. I would say in my teenage years, I really got involved with the church. So I can't really remember having any questions for or about God at the time. When I got older and in my teenage years, um, I don't believe God was condemning at all. I believe that God was very loving and very kind. And when I began to develop a relationship with God, uh, as I got older in the church, I began to learn a lot more about the character of God than the people in the church were teaching me. I began to learn that God was not just telling me, you're going to hell if you don't change this. I don't believe that God was frowning at me and pointing his finger at me saying, you know, this is wrong, you need to stop. I believe that God was very loving and very compassionate, and that is what really drew me into building a relationship with him. So I had gone through this process. My church started uh, my pastors, we're all around the same age. We all graduated high school together. Church started a week after we graduated high school. And so I knew in going into building this church, starting this ministry and being a part of it, I could not be gay. I had to let this go. I didn't want to bring any reproach on the church. And I sincerely at that time had a desire to walk away from the lifestyle because I understood what, what it meant for me and what it entailed. I wanted to be healed and accepted for me and not just if accepting male attention meant accepting that, that unnatural sexual behavior. I wanted to separate myself from that. And so I thought getting married would do that. I thought I could sort of marry the gay away. I, um, I, I love my wife. I did then, and I love her tremendously now, but at the time, I, I wanted to marry her to get rid of the gayness. And, and once we did that, and I recognized that even and still in our marriage, we had real genuine love for one another, on the side, I still had this desire for that male attention, male affection, and by this time, I had real strong sexual desires to be with other men. Uh, it became very difficult to live life. And I remember I got into my first real emotional relationship with a man. My wife and I had been married for about a year and she was pregnant with our first child. I lost my job. I had gotten another job at an airport and I began to develop this relationship with this guy that I met there. And I started having communication problems in my marriage with my wife. Her and I weren't speaking as much. We weren't really connecting as much. And so I began to separate myself emotionally from my marriage. So it became very difficult to even be home. And so when I got to work with this guy that I was able to talk to freely, he was an op open homosexual. And so I felt like I can be open with him about my secret sexual desires. Because by this time, the church had started, and I knew that I had to hide any desire that I still had for a same-sex attraction. And so going to work at this time was a real escape route for me. I do remember um, at one point becoming angry with God when I first started this job because it took me out of church on Sundays. And I remember praying, God, give me favor and allow me to not have to work on Sundays because I know that if I have to go to work on Sundays and I have to miss church and I don't have that accountability, I'm going to fall all the way back into this lifestyle. And I remember getting my schedule and there was nothing that could be done. I had to work every Sunday and I was out of church for a year. I was devastated. And so I remember developing this real close, intimate relationship with this guy. And he was sort of a mentor into the gay world for me because up until now, I'd just been flirting around with different sexual experiences. But this guy was teaching me about what living a gay lifestyle was really about, what it looked like to have a real relationship with another man. And so that became a real reality for me. And so at that time, I, him and I grew so close that if, if he took a vacation day at work, I took a vacation day. When we scheduled our vacation weeks, I, we scheduled them at the same time. When he took lunch, I took lunch. When you saw him, you saw me. We were so close and we began to develop this soul tie that people started to assume at work that we were dating one another and we were not. We had just grown really close, but we didn't deny it. We said, we'll go with it. So at work, we were boyfriends. At home, I was still a husband and a father. And then at church, when I did get a chance to go to church, I was Pastor Raleigh. And so I was living all of these different lives and it became too much for me. I, I just remember one day sitting in my car saying, God, I, I'm tired of fighting. So either I'm going to live this lifestyle all the way or you are gonna to have to magically de deliver me because I have no more strength, no more ability in me to fight. And so 
I, I just, I can always, even in that, that state, I call it a state of rebellion for me because I was still angry with God and I blamed God for me going deeper into this life. I still always remember God's love and compassion never leaving me. And so when I got to the point where I couldn't handle living all of those lives anymore, I remember sitting in my car uh, before I went into work one day and I was listening to a message on the radio. I just happened to turn it on and um, the pastor was, was speaking about grace and hope and redemption and the love of God. And I remember saying, God, this is not who I am. You have to help me. And I felt as if God came and sat on the passenger seat next to me. And he said, son, when you're ready, I'm still here. When you are ready to make the decision to turn away from this and fight again, I'll give you strength. I'm still here. And I remember weeping and I wept until it was time for me to go into work. And when I got into work, I wept some more. I had to leave my workstation, go to the restroom, and I wept because I felt an overwhelming peace come upon me and an ability to fight this thing. And so I began to ask God to separate me and this guy that I had gotten involved with and that was sort of mentoring me. I'd ask God to separate us. I said, God, you know, if I'm going to fight this, you got to separate us. And he did. It was, it was so amazing amazing because that next day I went to work and we were scheduled to work together and he was waiting for me because he had gotten there before me and he was crying. He said, I can't do this anymore. I can't work here anymore. I can't be here anymore. I'm tired of my life. I need to move on. I'm leaving. Don't try to stop me. Goodbye. And he left and I was at work and I was so shocked, but I said, God, you are really here with me and you answered my prayer and you separated us so that I can now focus on building my relationship with you and I can focus on my marriage and my family and I can really focus on who I am. So I started reading my Bible. I had a supervisor at work. She was a Christian. She knew what was going on between me and this guy and when we separated and uh, he disappeared and I was still there and she saw me praying more and reading my Bible more and just really separating myself more. She told me she could see a difference in me and that whatever it was that I was doing now, I needed to keep doing it. And so I started to work hard at repairing my marriage. At this time, my wife had been very supportive. She had been very patient with me. She had been very kind. She didn't do her much emotional and mental abuse at my hands, but she was still there and she loved me and cared for me. So I worked hard at repairing things with her and I worked hard at focusing on my family. I always say that when we renew our vows, my son is gonna be my best man because at that time he was about one years old and I can remember uh, I could have the worst day possible. And at that time I was getting off work and getting home uh, a little after midnight. And he would wait up for me to get home. And I can remember looking forward to having that interaction with him. And I remember saying, I will never leave my son to suffer through rejection and hatred like my father left me to suffer through rejection and hatred and leaving me confused. And so that brings me up to the point that I am at today where I am able to say, I have been transformed and I am no longer a homosexual. It brings me to the point today where I can say I have a genuine care and concern for everybody that's struggling or living in the lifestyle of homosexuality. It has been my experience that you have to dig deep into the roots of why they live the life that they live because everyone's experience is different. And so it just amazes me now to see the love and the, the care and the compassion of God throughout this entire process. When I started developing my relationship with God, his presence was always known to me. Doesn't matter where I was, what I was doing, what guy I was making out with, what guy I was texting or talking to on the phone and having explicit conversations with, I could always feel like God was there. And I remember, I can remember hearing God say, son, I love you every single day. And I rejected that love for a long time. When I started to receive that love, that's when the transformation began to happen. And so it wasn't until I, I started to accept the love of God and I started to accept my differences from everyone else and not reject myself because all the rejection I had suffered, um, I began to reject myself. It wasn't until I learned to love myself and have care and compassion for myself that I really started to go through the process of being transformed. It's very prevalent in the church. And I can say that from my experience, I was able to hide it and get away with it. Nobody knew 
that I was living these secret lives. And I remember saying, God, I go to this church where all these people are prophesying and all of these people are, you know, saying that they can predict this and do that. How come no one can pick up that I am struggling the way that I'm struggling? And so I know that it is prevalent in the church and there are men and women in the church that struggle with this, but there is a real fear to expose it because there's a fear of that rejection. My experience in the church, the church uh, uh, really has extended a hand of rejection to those that struggle in this lifestyle. It's almost like somebody that, that deals with, that's, that's living with leprosy or some other, you know, disease that you can get by just touching somebody. It's like the church extends that hand of rejection to, to people. So it was a real fear. I had a desire to talk to my pastors and other ministers and people about it because I wanted to come out of the lifestyle, but I knew that if I exposed it, I would expose myself to more rejection. It has been my experience that, yes, there are ministers and there are pastors that, that struggle with homosexuality or live, as we say, on the down low that, uh, I guess you can say, get away with it. There are pastors that preach sermons in the pulpits that preach against homosexuality and preach against lesbianism and the gay lifestyle, but they are secretly living it. And I believe that that is because they have just learned to accept the way that they're living for some. And for some, they want to do what it is that they want to do and they want to teach another thing. You know, I believe that it is, it's imperative now more than ever that the church begins to develop support systems for those that are struggling with homosexuality. Just like we support in the church those who are alcoholics or those that are drug addicts and they want to be delivered from alcohol or they want to be delivered from drug addiction, we take our time, we work with them, we are patient with them. We take our time and get to the root of why they are drawn to alcohol, why they are drawn to drugs or those men or women that are just promiscuous not homosexual, not homosexual, but just heterosexual promiscuity. I believe we take our time and we work with them. I believe the same type of ministry needs to be afforded to homosexuals and those that struggle in that lifestyle in the church. There needs to be a welcoming presence where even those, we, we welcome alcoholics in even before they are ready to be delivered from alcoholism. And we say, we're praying for you and ready for you. But when it comes to homosexuals, it's kind of like we put our hands up and say, no, you have to come out of this now or else. I believe that the church needs to develop a, a greater level of compassion, patience, long-suffering. I believe the church needs to put on the character of Christ when it comes to dealing with homosexuality. You know, it has always been a question in my mind as to why the church uh, treats homosexuals or homosexuality as it is different from any other sin. And I really believe that there's this misconception that uh, because you're a homosexual, you carry more diseases. And if I, I welcome you in or I touch you, I've heard pastors say or, or people in the church say, because you're a homosexual, I don't want to touch you because I don't know what type of diseases you may be carrying or what type of diseases you may be bringing in. Or I've heard homosexual uh, or, or heterosexual pastors say, I don't want you around my sons or around my daughters or around my people because I feel like your gayness is going to rub off on them. And so I just believe that there's this ignorance concerning the life of the homosexual and what homosexuals really do go through. To any homosexual male uh, that's struggling or living on the down low and they have a desire to come out of that lifestyle, I would say in my experience being one that did live on the down low, I was in the church and I was still living a homosexual life outside of the church. I would say to that homosexual male that there is hope. I would say that it is going to be a, a tough fight. There are going to be times when you are going to want to step out and be with other men. Uh, it has been my experience that you will have to fight those desires, but you cannot fight them alone. I have learned that with strong accountability, with a strong relationship with God, and with the trust in God, that you can be completely delivered from having any type of homosexual desire. But it's not going to be easy. Even now, when I minister to other young men who say, I'm struggling with this, this thing and I want to let it go, but I see no hope. I want to give up the fight. I always encourage them to never give up on what it is that you want to do. It's like a hope or a dream of one day being free from this lifestyle. We teach people never give up on your hopes, never give up on your dreams. If you want to be a business owner, it's not going to be easy. You have to fight. I teach young men that, or, or older men that are struggling homosexuals, it is the same way. You can never give up the fight, but you have to have strong accountability, strong men and women that will be around you, that will support you, that will tell you the truth, that will uh, uh, feed you healthy words, that will feed you 
you with encouragement, that will push you when they see that you are standing still. It's, it's important to have a developed relationship with God that when it becomes difficult to fight the passions and fight the desires, I have learned that in, in my most difficult moments when I found it hard not to send that text message or not to pick up that phone and make that phone call or not to get on that chat line, it has been in those moments when I have said, God, you have got to help me. You have to help me. If I don't feel your presence now and if I don't feel you pull this desire away from me now, I am going to fall. And God has always been faithful to pull me away from that desire. I am today a completely transformed, strong man of God. I am a man that has a desire to see others that are struggling in the homosexual lifestyle be free. I am a man that wants to bring a voice of difference that we have not heard. I want to understand the mind and the heart of the homosexual, how they feel, the, the rejection, the fear, the pain. I want to minister to all of those areas. And so I believe that I'm a man that God has anointed and ordained for this time to be that voice of difference to the homosexual community and inviting them into the church to be delivered. As you have just watched the testimony of Raleigh Mayberry, please know that there are an innumerable amount of people who have successfully exited homosexuality. I know that there are some who believe that this is impossible. But listen to what Jesus said. Jesus said in Luke 18 and 27 that things that are impossible with man, that they are very, very possible with God. Therefore, it is imperative that we spread this message of hope to let others who do not wish to embrace their homosexual feelings or their same-sex attractions. We must get this message to them and let them know that there is a way of escape. Did you know that according to the Trevor Project that suicide attempts are four times higher with lesbian, gay, and bisexual youth in comparison to straight youth? Yes, that is a fact, according to the Trevor Project. Now, if people, if youth are choosing to attempt suicide, maybe it's a possibility that they do not want to embrace their homosexual attractions or their same-sex feelings. Therefore, we must let them know that there is another way out. For Jesus said, that things that are impossible with man, it may not be possible with the teacher or the counselor, maybe not possible with the psychologist or the psychiatrist, but with God, all things are possible. Thank you for joining me today. I pray you were edified, encouraged, and empowered to pursue God's transforming power for your life. I wanna hear from you. Please take a few minutes to email me your comments or compassionate concerns. My team and I are available to assist you on your journey. Visit my website, lindajernigan.com, and there you will find helpful resources available to further strengthen you. And remember, Jeremiah 32 and 27, God is the God of all flesh. Therefore, there is nothing too hard for him. Are you or someone you know physically attracted to the same sex? If so, you can receive this trend-setting book, Rescuing Homosexuals, for only $9.99.